With the invention of the DC electric motor in 1832, it was only a matter of time until someone would attempt an electric vehicle. Actually, electric trams were made as early as 1837, but as the rechargeable battery didn't show up until 1859, the options were to constantly replace the batteries or to electrify the tracks. So naturally, personal vehicles were still a little ways off. The first being the French Trove electric tricycle of 1881. Electric cars were soon to follow. In the U.S., that meant the Morrison Electric of the 1890s, a car able to cruise at 14 miles an hour and top out at 20, and costing an astronomical $3,600, although that's pretty much on par with other experimental cars of the period. It had an impressive 4-horsepower electric motor and nearly 800 pounds of batteries. Electric seemed to show much promise. Prior to 1900, most speed and distance records were set by electric cars, and many early companies opted to go the electric route, such as Studebaker, who built electric cars from 1902 to 1912. Electric cars were particularly popular with upper-class women for their clean, simple, and relatively quiet operation. But by 1915, they had all but disappeared due to high cost, lack of infrastructure, and increasingly outclassed range. There were exceptions, of course. The Anderson Carriage Company started producing the Detroit Electric in 1907. Range was 80 miles and a top speed of 20 miles an hour, although people would add additional batteries in an attempt to increase both range and speed. Most survivors are using much more modern batteries. And they had a slight revival during the First World War, when gas prices spiked and most of their competition was already gone. The stock market crash of 1929 nearly killed the company, but they managed to continue limited production for another 10 years, producing nearly 40,000 cars in 32 years of production. The German Hansa started with electric cars in 1905 and was still building electric commercial trucks between the wars, such as the Hansa Lloyd Electro Last Wagon. The Japan and German electric cycle car of 1919-1924 was a sort of road-going electric wheelchair for the handicapped veterans of World War I. Also known as the Slabby Behringer Electro Wagon, it would become the first DKW car when it was adapted for a small gasoline engine, a car that would eventually evolve into the modern Audi. And electric cars would start to make a comeback in the 1960s, at least in theory. Attempts to convert mainstream cars to electric would be done both by the manufacturers and outside sources. But the issues remain the same. The Renault-based Hini Kilowatt had both a range and a top speed of 60. Fewer than 100 were made, and those few that sold were primarily to electric companies. AMC experimented with electric Hornets and Gremlins, and even built specialty electric vehicles. But like most of these experiments never developed into any kind of real production vehicle. Electric vehicles did have their niche, primarily forklifts and golf carts, and similar vehicles intended for short range or enclosed areas where exhaust was a health issue, or even more specialized vehicles, such as the Lunar Rover or Moon Buggy. And the purpose-built electric cars sold to the public were also right along these same lines such as the city car of 1974 to 1977, and later revived as the commuter car, essentially just an enclosed golf cart. There were a variety of versions, ranging from 2.5 to 12 horsepower, with up to a 40-mile range and a top speed as high as 50. Both cars combined had a total production of less than 4,500, and this would be the norm for electric cars going forward, although few would be as successful such as the Corbin or Myers Swallow, made from 1999 to 2012, a single-seat three-wheeler with a range from 20 to 60 miles and a top speed of 70, a $30,000 go-kart with a claimed mile-per-gallon equivalent of 126. For the most part, the market had continued to be limited to conversion kits for existing cars, which often cost more than the car being converted was worth. Then... Government regulations began to push towards zero emissions in the early 1990s, which would mean new attempts at electric vehicles. GM would be the first to dive into the deep end with the EV1, based on the impact prototype. 
In spite of a manufacturer's suggested retail price of $34,000, the cars were only available for lease and only in selected areas and serviced through Saturn dealerships. The cars had a 137 horsepower motor and originally lead acid batteries for a range of 55 miles, later upgraded to nickel metal hybrid batteries extending range to 105 miles. The cars were made from 1996 to 1999. For the most part, what the car did was create controversies on both sides of the EV debate. And after some 2,500 were built, GM decided the venture was unprofitable and in 2003 destroyed the cars to avoid having to provide any continued support for them, creating additional controversy. But the real issue was that the tech still wasn't really there to make a practical competitive electric car. The big step forward ended up being the laptop lithium-ion battery. Seeing its first real major success with the Tesla Roadster of 2008 to 2012. With an EPA range of over 240 miles and a mile per gallon equivalent of 120, while hitting 60 in under 4 seconds with a top speed of 125 miles an hour, nearly 2,500 sold. That isn't to say the golf cart mentality was gone. An electric version of the Smart 4.2 was introduced in 2007, an electric version of the Mitsubishi i in 2009, and the Fiat 500e in 2013. The Nissan Leaf, introduced in 2011, was a purpose-built electric car that made an attempt to be a mainstream car. Its original range was just above 70 miles, but has since increased to 225, demonstrating the amount of progress made in recent years. Since its introduction, Nissan has sold more than 500,000 of them. But the car that really got the world's attention was the Tesla Model S introduced in 2012. It was roomy, and it was fast, and Tesla even started building its own infrastructure to support them. The car of the future available now. Throw in a nerdy, rebellious, and socially active figurehead, and Tesla was hard to ignore. Although far from cheap, starting at nearly $60,000. The gas electric hybrid was supposed to help us ease into the electric car lifestyle, which caught on more as a warped sort of status symbol than anything else, followed by the extended range and plug in hybrids that could be used as an electric vehicle, but had the old internal combustion engine for backup when you needed it, which didn't really ever take off, perhaps because most people didn't really understand the difference. In most cases, a hybrid's added economy didn't make up for the initial price premium, at least not outside of high mileage commercial fleets, and were otherwise often not very good cars overall. So the technology started to shift towards exotic performance models. But small full electric cars were gaining some degree of acceptance. BMW's i3 introduced in 2013 would quickly become one of the more popular electric car offerings but prices still started well above 40000 A lot of money for an economy car, even with an equivalent mile per gallon of nearly 125, which may be why BMW will replace it with an electric version of its small SUV, the iX3. Attempts at more affordable mainstream electric cars arrived in 2017 with both the Chevy Bolt and Tesla Model 3. The Bolt managed to get the price closer to $30,000, with the help of government subsidies, but it was still essentially an expensive small hatchback. The Tesla was easily $5,000 more expensive, but also more resembled a mid-sized family car than an Econobox. The first real competitor to the Tesla Model S would be the Porsche Taycan, introduced in 2019. Just as fast, the more experienced company was able to build a superior car. Of course, it also had a starting price nearly $25,000 higher, pushing it well above the $100,000 mark. But like everything else, the trend is towards SUVs, and Tesla is no exception with the Model X. The real success, however, coming from the aggressive marketing by Ford with the Mach-E, with an ever-increasing market, now including pickups, as well as new brands such as Lucid, Rivian, and Canoe. Tesla would become the first manufacturer to produce more than a million electric cars, and the Lucid Air was declared car of the year. 
So not surprisingly, we are once again being told this is the future of the automobile. They have a Rolls-Royce quiet ride, unless you get on it, and then it turns into an annoying high-pitched whine. And there is a presumed increase in reliability, as an electric motor is much simpler, with fewer moving parts to fail than an internal combustion engine. Although the build quality of many of these vehicles has yet to be proven. And they are cleaner. Clean in the sense that there's no exhaust, and no oil to drip in the driveway. Well, not much anyway. Although accessories are also moving from hydraulic to electric. Moving parts still need to be lubricated, and cooling is even a bigger issue with electrics. Of course, the most talked about downside of electrics is still range, which in optimal conditions is actually not that bad, even if estimates are often optimistic at best, and get worse in temperature extremes, or if you use the AC, or if it's under a load, or if you drive aggressively. Which you can also say about non-electrics, but not to such an extensive extent. In exchange for the higher price, you'll get an overinflated comparison to miles per gallon to make it sound like you're saving money. And that is, of course, after government subsidies to reduce the price to make it seem almost affordable. They will tell you the range is more than good enough for the average commuter, but then so is a moped or scooter, and that doesn't make it practical transportation. Then you have the leisure charging times. You can charge it overnight at your convenience, or use a supercharger and get it done in as little as 20 minutes, depending on the car and range. Got to pay attention to those miles per minute of charging. Of course, you still have to plan your trips around charging stations, and hope they are available when you get there, and not backed up like a gas station during the fuel crisis. Speaking of lack of infrastructure, if you live in a place with regular brownouts or limits on air conditioning use due to overtaxed power grids, expect that to get worse. And of course, all those batteries add a ton of weight. Weight that affects ride and handling and increases wear on suspension and brakes. Fortunately, most of them have a huge amount of torque on demand to cart that weight up to speed as if it's not even there. Then there's the issue of all those batteries crammed under the floor overheating and catching fire. Not a huge chance of that happening, but a greater chance of a fire than in, say, a rear-ended Pinto. And odds are your local fire department is neither trained or equipped for those kinds of fires. But that is part of why you're paying higher insurance premiums on an electric car. Then there's the whole myth of electrics being environmentally friendly. Even if we overlook the fact that in the U.S. only about a third of our electricity comes from clean energy, and even some of that clean energy has a negative environmental impact, once you take into account lithium mining poisoning local environments, and similar concerns are worse with the battery disposal, the new electric Hummer is no more environmentally friendly than the original, possibly less so. Basically, they are disposable cars that you can't dispose of. That will lead to the used car market being flooded with vehicles in need of highly expensive battery replacements, which you won't even be able to do yourself due to the safety and environmental concerns. And somehow I doubt the batteries having a separate lease is going to help that issue. But it will make that old beater gas burner all the more valuable. So if you're going to go electric, remember to go solar first. As always, thanks for watching. Don't forget to comment below and like and subscribe.